My name is Bill Jepson, and uh, I'm a retired high school teacher. I taught at Eden Prairie and Hopkins uh, U.S. History, U.S. History, U.S. History, all social studies courses. And then I, uh, I've been with the Minnetonka Historical Society. Testing, testing. There, that's my. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, I've done a number of presentations here over the years, and um, this one I kind of, I did first uh, in about 15 years ago, and uh, I think it was my first one here, and it needed a lot of updating, and, and so with the help of the internet, you can find so many things. Now, so uh, this one I decided to focus on um, all of Minnehaha Creek's watershed, including uh, where I grew up over by Lake Erie. So let's begin. Today, we're going to uh, look at the clash of two human cultures in the 19th century. What happened here along Minnehaha Creek over 80 years' time was a microcosm of what happened throughout America. The Native Americans were hunters and gatherers with their culture. On the left there, as you can see in the Seth Eastman painting, of many half walls. And the European immigrants coming to America had a head start of about 4,000 years uh, from when they were hunters and gatherers. Their uh, culture became um, agricultural, where they owned a piece of land and grew their crops and stayed in one place. And then in the 1700s, they advanced another level to the industrial age with uh, steel tools and weapons and steam power. So, and plus they had many millions more people coming over. So the uh, Native Americans had been decimated down to about 5 million people from the original 60 million uh, by the 1800s. And so here come five to 10 million Europeans. So it was really a clash which uh, the Native Americans had quite a disadvantage. So, uh, and this happened on a grand scale, <clears throat> you know, nationwide, and was mirrored on, on a smaller scale in our city, in the center of the country, near the, the only waterfall on the Mississippi River that uh, was the lifeblood of America, the waterway from the Ohio in the east all the way to the Missouri and down to the Gulf of Mexico. And with the power of the mills on St. Anthony Falls and Minnehaha Creek flowed the means to great industry and wealth. This was the economic engine that drove the growth of Minnesota. Minnesota became a state in 1858, a few years after the treaties were signed that transferred ownership of the land from the indigenous people to the European Americans. Seen here, in this map on the right, starting with 1805 for the land around Minnehaha Creek, right around here. And we'll go into, into detail about all this. Here's the area that we'll examine today through the interesting legacies of the people that lived their lives out in the 1800s. These people experienced a dramatic culture clash, perhaps like no other in the history of mankind. The land along this waterway flowing from the sacred Lake Minnetonka past the chain of beautiful lakes draining into it and onto the great Mississippi River was very attractive to the first settlers in the early 1800s who arrived here when it was an unspoiled wilderness, living in harmony with the indigenous people. So you, you can see, and this is a Seth Eastman painting too. We'll be looking at a lot of those. And so let's look at the indigenous people first. Minnesota in the early 1800s had two main tribes of indigenous people in the south where the Dakota depicted on the left with the uh, chief of the Dakota tribe. And they were a Plains Indian uh, their culture, rather, and they uh, hunted buffalo primarily, but also deer and every, everything else. Uh, but they were more nomadic, and 
They didn't like being called the Sioux. The Sioux is a derogatory name <clears throat> given to them, which means enemy, by their enemy, the Ojibwe. Um, so they don't like Sioux, they like, it's Dakota. And on the right is the Ojibwe. They live in the north in the forest. They uh, hunted deer and muskrat and beaver hunted and caught fish and harvested wild rice. They prefer not being called Chippewa, which was a mispronunciation of the Chippewa, a Chippewa by the uh, European Americans. And their language is a little different than the Dakota coming from uh, the Algonquin speaking bands farther out east. So the Chippewa were being pushed from the east as the white men came and then they push, put pressure on the Dakotas as they push down. But we are living right on the border of this, which we'll talk about in a second. And so here's uh, some paintings of the Ojibwe in a sugar camp on the top right, and then wild rice hunting, or, or harvesting rather, um, both Seth Eastman paintings. And on the left is a colorized photograph of an Ojibwe uh, named Arrowmaker. It's a rare colored photograph, colorized. And then, as we look at the Dakota, they lived in these villages along the Minnesota River and at Minnehaha Creek watershed, where they hunted buffalo on the prairies south of Minnesota, south in Minnesota. And they were nomadic following the herds with new camps in their teepees every season. And the teepees were made of buffalo hides. This map shows many of the groups of the Dakota tribes, such as the Mittawakanton that today are, own the casino south of Minneapolis. And here's a Dakota chief painted by Charles Russell, one of my favorites. And in the bottom left is Buffalo Hunt by George Catlin. So uh, there was a trail from Mille Lacs, where the Ojibwe were centered, down to uh, down to uh, the Minnesota River, where the the Dakota had their villages, and it goes right through Minnetonka Mills by the Burwell House, and so the red line and the trail. This is the trail that went right through there on the map. And uh, so there was a lot of interaction in our area as they were trying to go around uh, Lake Minnetonka to the east as they traveled north and south. And that trail is right here where, uh, where uh, there's a little park with a pavilion on it by the Dairy Queen, you know, on Minnetonka Boulevard. And that uh, is, and, and the upper left shows another South Eastman painting of two uh, Native Americans, or Dakotas, um, fishing. And uh, the bottom right, you can see the canoers today, and upper right is the view from the bridge, which is where the mill was too, and uh, that is the actual crossing where they came across. And if you look at the area we're talking about today, you can see the familiar modern map here uh, with Lake Minnetonka just off to the left and the creek flowing out of that past Lake Herod and Bidet Makaska, which was Lake Calhoun all the way to the falls. And uh, if you look at this watershed map of the Minnehaha Creek uh, brochure, they show all the places that have been developed today, all the pink around Lake Minnetonka, mostly to the east. It's just solid developed urban city. And if you go back to the 1800s, you see that it originally was forested, mostly with some areas of prairie and swamp, and, 
And that's the way it was for 10,000 years until about 170 years ago. This uh, picture here is some Native Americans. When you were asked, some of the gentleman here was asking, uh, and they're sitting on the, the south side of the falls. And so we start our story here with Zebulon Pike in 1805. Uh, he was, he actually came up the river from St. Louis under orders from Thomas Jefferson at the same time that Lewis and Clark were just reaching the Pacific Ocean. They came back from Fort Clatsop of Portland in 1806. So this is 1805 and Zebulon Pike on the right uh, was ordered to go up there and find a site for a fort. So, because uh, they knew, Jefferson knew that we would need to settle this land, and, and we were in a fight with the British over fur trading there too as well. So, Pike chose the site of the future Fort Snelling, uh, right here uh, at the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi River. Nearby was St. Anthony Falls that, that would provide water power for cutting lumber and grinding flour. And the St. Croix River as well provided a connection to the Great Lakes through the Brule River in Wisconsin, north to Lake Superior. As he looked down from the bluff, he saw that the Minnesota River on the right was sky blue water which is the Native American word for Midian's water, so did the sky blue. And it's apparent when you stand there in those days because it was much clearer than the muddy Mississippi coming down from the left. And so on this famous painting, that's the Mississippi on the right and the Minnesota on the left. So then they named the state after the river, of course. And so here's um, what the fort, which was built many years later in 1819, looks like uh, with a little aerial and a graphic of, of the buildings. But this tract, this map here, uh, was bought by Pike from the Native Americans. And it extended uh, nine miles wide on each side of the Mississippi River, included Lake Harriet and Lake Calhoun in those days, just inside the western edge of what later was called the Fort Snelling Military Reservation. The lakes would not have been drawn according to the Indians' regulations in 1830. Uh, they only gave Pike the land as far as they could see around the fort without elevating the eyes. But Pike included the lakes when he was drawing the map for them. Um, they never had maps before, they just shared the land. And uh, so it was a new concept for them. And he took advantage of that. If you take a closer look at the, this map, it's pretty interesting with the uh, names of everything, which, and this is actually later in 1835 territorial map that they drew the names that were originally on there. And uh, if you look closely, you see the Minnehaha Creeks flowing out of a round lake, which they didn't know really much what it was at the time. So they just drew a circle over here and they called it Lake Le Leavenworth because Colonel Leavenworth came in 1819 to build the, the fort for the first time. There was a little uh, delay after 1805 to 1819 because of the War of 1812. They, had, they got the land from the British. And, they, uh, and when that was all settled, then they sent Colonel Leavenworth up there. So they named that for, um, for him, even though they didn't really know exactly where Lake Minnetonka was. And the next lake that I grew up on is named after Harriet. Does anybody know? Who she is? 
She is the wife of, of Colonel Leavenworth. So Harriet Lovejoy was her name. And she's shown here in this picture. Um, and the original Dakota name for that lake is Bede Unma, which means other lake. U-N-M-A, Bede is lake, Unma is other. And recently, you probably know, uh, about four years ago, five years ago, um, Lake Calhoun was changed back to its original name, Bede Makaska, which means lake of the white earth, which they think meant, meant the white sand of the beaches there. And that was a big controversy for many years, for ever since the Civil War, that it was named after John C. Calhoun, who was one of the, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, first senators, well, he was the first senator that uh, wanted to break off, he was pro-slavery, and uh, even though he died in 1850, he led the movement to, to, that led to the Civil War. And, uh, and he had also been uh, vice president under two presidents later. But at this time, in 1819, he was the Secretary of War for Madison, so he's the one who ordered uh, Leavenworth up there, and that's why they named it for him. And then on the right, uh, Cedar Lake is, um, it was named Fort, uh, was named uh, Josiah Snellen. So, uh, and then there's two other lakes here, Mud Lake and Amelia. What lakes do you think those are? Iowatha and Nokomis. And you can see the creek going up here. They called it Little Falls Creek at the time because compared to St. Anthony Falls, little, uh, Minnehaha Falls were pretty little. And, um, and you notice that there is a creek coming out of Lake Harriet on the southeast side into uh, Minnehaha Creek. So here's what the fort looked like. Um, Pike Island to the right, Mendota to the left, the Minnesota River on the left. And of course, when you go by here today, there's a huge super highway 494 going across, and I, I put a little airplane in there. Because <laughs> they're landing every hour there. Um, but 200 years ago today, uh, the uh, Minnehaha Creek was navigated by two young men, Brown and Snelling, who, uh, who uh, had heard that there was rumors that there was this wonderful sacred lake about two uh, days paddle up the creek. And so on the left is Jose, Joe Brown, and on the right is William, is, is Josiah Snelling. We don't have a picture of his son, William, who uh, was friends with Joe. And so, so Bill and Joe grabbed his canoe in the spring and headed up the, the creek. They had the portage around Minnehaha Falls and a couple other uh, rapids, but they made it to, um, you can see their first camp was right here, number one, around Penn Avenue. And uh, then the second day they made it all the way up to the lake and uh, went out to Big Island. and. Uh, Meanwhile, Josiah Snelling was really worried about his only son, and uh, he sent a search party up there and found them catching fish and eating strawberries on the big island. <laughs> and he took them by the ear, said, you come back here. He was very worried because this was Native American uh, uh, property at the time. And in fact, Wyzetta was a village that they went past a Native American village on the north side of that bay. <clears throat> and uh, when they came around the bend there, oh, you can see they came, Minnehaha Creek comes out of Gray's Bay today and then Wyzetta Bay here. And Wyzetta Village was there. And then uh, Big Island is over here. There's a marker uh, that talks a little bit about this on, uh, in Mound on the beach there that you can see there. 
And so uh, it only took one day to bring them back on the creek going downstream. But uh, the interesting thing is that it was kept a secret from 1822 until 1851 when uh, the treaties were signed handing over the, the land. And so uh, we kept the secret under the orders of Joe Snelling, Josiah Snelling, the commander, and others. And uh, by the way, these paintings I found are all in the 1890s by Winslow Homer. And they really make me think of those two boys. Uh, but they were the first ones to go up, uh, up there. And we know that uh, it was kept a secret because Stephen Long was an explorer in 1839 or so. And his detailed map here does not show Lake Minnetonka anywhere. And also Joseph uh, Nicollet, you know, Nicollet Avenue. Uh, on his map, you see the creek, Fort Snelling, Lake Harriet, Lake Calhoun, and nothing at the end of it. And that was uh, in 1843. So the Native Americans were uh, hunting and fishing, and here's a few pictures of them uh, hunting buffalo, and with a bow and arrow probably shooting a deer, and then fishing, and then on the bottom right is um, hunting muskrats in the winter. Their culture was centered on the means of survival, which was hunting and gathering, but the, um, and, and um, another example, some other examples of more of the Dakota who were hunting buffalo. Uh, I had never known before that, well I knew they were on, uh, horseshoes, or rather, snowshoes, snowshoes, and that would help them in the winter because the buffalo were, if it's deep snow, they were bogged down, they could not move very fast, and so they could walk up to them uh, because their horses weren't any good in, in the winter either. But I had never seen this before. Uh, apparently, dogs were really a big help to the Native Americans in those uh, days, and uh, in this case, they're pulling a sled, like it's a dog sled, and he's catching up to the buffalo that way. These paintings here are by another great um, artist, George Catlin, who is um, very famous for 600 paintings of 50 different tribes during the 1830s. And so, but now to uh, Major Tolliver, it looks like Talia Farrell, but it's Tolliver pronounced. And he was the agent for the Native Americans at Fort Snelling. And he was appointed by Monroe uh, to, uh, to negotiate good relationships with the Native Americans, and hopefully to turn them into uh, farmers who stayed in one place instead of hunters and gatherers. And there was a lot of resistance to that at first. But he was successful on Lake Calhoun. He started a village there called, uh, called Eatonville after one of his commanders. You can see it here on the southeast side of Lake Calhoun. And we're gonna focus on the people who lived on in that area a little bit here as we go along. One of the goals was to teach the natives Americans to farm in order that they could become self-sufficient. And uh, he began this endeavor here uh, with Cloud Man. Uh, Cloud Man's Dakota Village was right here on, this, on the uh, southeast shore. And uh, they were within the military reservation, but far enough away from the fort that he could maybe have some success there. And sure enough, he did. Uh, by 1830, they were growing corn and potatoes and had a bumper crop on 80 acres with a couple hundred villagers. Uh, it was one of the only examples of Native Americans attempting to become farmers. And then here's a Seth Eastman painting of them. Uh, what do you think they're doing here over this corn crop, the, the women? They're on these scaffolds with 
blankets, yelling, and tambourines. They're trying to get the crows away. And when the crows came in the fall, they, if you didn't do anything, they would just eat all your crop. So it was something they had to struggle with. And they, by 1833, there were 125 Dakota living there on uh, Badea Makaska. The women did most of the work, hoeing and planting, while the children drove off the uh, flocks of crows. Um, so there was a lot of resistance, though, mostly from the men who wanted to keep hunting. And well, this is a close-up of that area, Lake Harriet on the bottom, and Calhoun. Uh, and right here was where Lakewood Cemetery is, is where that was. Let's look a little more about this area, which is very interesting. Um, in 1834, two missionary brothers arrived at Fort Snelling and would figure prominently in this village and would become the first white men to build their homes in Minneapolis outside of the fort. They had converted to Christianity in Connecticut and headed west to convert the Native Americans. Samuel Pond was 26 on the left and Gideon Hollister Pond was 24 when they left, when they arrived at Fort Snelling in 1834. They were bright, enthusiastic, amicable, and six feet tall. <laughs> Brothers had no license to enter the Indian country, but Major Tolliver waived all the technicalities because he thought that they would be very helpful in his project at Eatonville with uh, turning the Native Americans into farmers. So. <laughs> And they built this little cabin here. And if you remember looking southeast on Lake Calhoun, when you go around it, there's a gold dome church. And it's a Greek Orthodox church. That's the hill exactly where they, their cabin was. And it was chosen there because uh, Cloud Man, remember, is the, the chief of the Dakota village just below there. And he said you could see the looms from there um, on the lake. And in fact, uh, I think it's interesting that around 1900, there was a big push to change Lake Calhoun to Lake Mendoza, which would be a really cool name, M-E-N-D-O-Z-A. It means loon, because there are loons on the lake. And, uh, but uh, there was a battle back and forth on the name in Calhoun 1. So uh, anyway, uh, there's a marker at the bottom of the hill that is sinking into the ground now. Uh, it was put in there around 1900. And on it, it says, on the hill above was erected the first dwelling in Minneapolis by Samuel and Gideon Pond, missionaries to the Indians, June 1834. And their little um, shack had two rooms and a cellar covering 12 by 16 feet made out of oak logs and uh, a door and a window given to them by Major Tolliver. And they lived there for a number of years. And their view down towards the lake was of Cloud Man's village, and the only painting we have of it is Seth Eastman's. Here's Seth Eastman, who uh, was married to Cloud Man's daughter, and therefore knew the ways of the Native Americans and painted hundreds of paintings, like this one on the right of a Dakota village, another one in more detail, and uh, some more uh, Dakota hunting uh, buffalo on the left in the winter. So I have always loved his uh, paintings and a couple books of them. Here is a photo of the younger Samuel Pond and his hand-drawn map that the family uh, drew and sent back east to their to Connecticut showing the Indian trails to and from the fort from Lake Calhoun at the time. Lake Harriet, they just drew a little circle. But, uh, and then here's Little River, or Little Creek in, in uh, Hiawatha and Nokomis. And these Native American trails just through the wilderness to St. Anthony Falls, which was only, which was not any houses yet. It was just to the falls. Um, and one of their goals, uh, besides Christ, uh, turning them into good Christians, they thought 
was the first step was to uh, learn the Dakota language. So they're very famous, the Pine Brothers are for uh, their English reader here and a uh, monthly newspaper. And on the left, you can see the dictionary with the Native American words, uh, all the A words. And so they worked on that the whole time and became very fluent in Dakota, the first people to do that. Ask a question. Sure. Where is that marker that you... It's directly below on the southeast side of the Gold Dome Church. So by 36th Street, where it comes uh, heading uh, west, and bumps into the lake. Uh, if you're right there, on the right is the Pond Brothers Cabin, and on the left would be the uh, Cloud Man's Village. And so uh, things were going very well for the Pond Brothers for the first two years, but many changes happened in May 1835 when along came Reverend Jebediah Stevens and his wife and niece and, and, and uh, his niece a teacher. And he had all the uh, um, he had all the credentials for being a minister, so he kind of had this haughty attitude towards the pond as well. They you know, got their, their uh, credentials yet, so he treated them not so well, and he had them do duties around uh, as he took over the mission, and in fact built a new one with the help of Gideon, who was a very good um, uh, carpenter, and they built a mission home uh, in a little school right where the bandstand is next to the uh, next to the spring there where the water pump is and you can see it on this this map here Stevens um, and so uh, they set up a little school there and uh, they had also with them a six year old foster daughter named Jane DeBow, and uh, she uh, lived there with the Native Americans, and it's kind of interesting because uh, she is uh, known today as Jane DeBow Gibbs, and in over by the state fair in Larpenter is a uh, their farmhouse that she lived in later with her husband and uh, this cabin, and it's a museum like the Burwell House. And, uh, but there's many stories uh, written about her. As uh, she was only six years old here at uh, the Lake Harriet Mission. Here's a close-up of the map they drew kind of crudely of the, the houses that were there. They really weren't all along the west end of the lake. They were kind of right around where we hang out by the brick, by the bandstand today. And there's a little plaque there, first schoolhouse, uh, built by Reverend J.D. Stevens and Gideon Pond in 1835. So, but Jane Gibbs, very interesting, I found a, an excerpt for one of the many stories. Uh, there's a, a book called Little Bird That Was Caught, which is the Native American name, the Dakota name for them, for her, rather, for her. And uh, in this excerpt, she remembers uh, when she first came to the mission, and, and she uh, was traveling by ox cart from Fort Snelling. The, she's only six years old. The group traveled an, an Indian trail for nearly a full day before reaching Lake Harriet as they traveled along the Little River which is Mayhaw Creek. When the wagon finally stopped, Jane recalled the children ran to the top of a hill where they spied the new house across the lake and many, many teepees. Young Indian children heralded their arrival with shrill cries and dogs barked as they finally alighted from the wagons. She adopted the life of her friends swimming in the lakes, capturing and cooking the plentiful turtles and playing charade-like games all while subconsciously learning to speak the Dakota language. So she lived uh, on to have five children and moved to St. Paul uh, about when she was a teenager. 
at about 18 years old. And so Gideon Pond, meanwhile, um, uh, he and Sam went out east to get their credentials, um, well, especially Sam went all the way to Connecticut, and then came back uh, so that um, now they could continue their mission to uh, translate the Native American language. And you can go to his um, house that he moved to later in 1839 after there were some uh, battles between the Ojibwe and the Dakota around Lake Erie. They decided they better move. And so uh, in Bloomington at 104th and Nicollet is this uh, museum, which is very nice, lots of events. Uh, there's still a few of them this fall. I went out there last week, and, and uh, you can learn a lot about, they raised a, a number of children there, and he was a Presbyterian minister, and uh, lived there till he died until in 1878. And Sam uh, lived in Shakopee with the village, um, teaching the Dakota until he died in 1891. So, and we're running short of time, but uh, you can look up, uh, there's a depiction by Gideon Pond who's speaking in front of Lake Harriet, uh, the old folks um, group 50 years later, and he's describing this uh, war between, or battle between the Ojibwe and, and the Dakota. And uh, the, it was started uh, by the shore of Lake Harriet when two young um, Ojibwe decided to exact revenge on their father's death and shot a son of Cloud Man named Redbird. Uh, they ambushed him and shot him dead and then took his scalp. And when they brought the body back to the Cloud Man's village, uh, Gideon Pond would witness the whole thing and them all screaming and gathering all their forces over the next day or so and heading up north to Molas and fighting them. And actually it was one of the biggest battles. Uh, there were 95 total Ojibwe lost and the Dakota lost 17. And then they came back and had this uh, scalp dance, or victory dance, on Lake Harry, Lake California. You can imagine that, right, where the sailboats are. And for three days he describes how they put the scalps up on the poles and they're shrieking and, and, um, and it was uh, in jubilation then uh, because they had been victorious over their enemies, the Ojibwe. So this painting by uh, Seth Eastman is called Death Whoop, Whoop, it was like a whoop, uh, when he took the scalp and there's his painting, uh, or that's George Kaplan's painting of a scalp dance, an actual one. And if I had more time, but I, I've done it in a different presentation. There was a scalp dance right by the Burwell House, in between the Freer House and the school, uh, that was described by these two uh, gals in their 90s, the Atwood sisters. And they're describing it to Dana Freer, whose book uh, we're, hope, we're in the process of publishing, uh, hopefully in the next year or so, there'll be a book about the history of Minnetonka. And one of the more interesting stories is, is how they witnessed when they were about six years old in 1856. Right there, uh, a scout dance from another battle. And, <laughs> and their mother tried to uh, uh, help the natives because they were only a block away and brought them soup, but it didn't seem to do much to ease their suffering, she says. So back to this plot of land on Lake Calhoun, where the Pond Brothers cabin was, the next owner of it was the Charles Mousseau, who had, uh, I think, 10 children, nine out of 12 survived. And uh, uh, the interesting story about him, there, you don't have any pictures about him, or not much, but, but a number of sources say, and the, he one day killed a bear, a 700 pound black bear, 
After a bloody and exciting fight with the monster near the shore of Lake Calhoun. And so, in 1852, imagine him. So, I found this picture, but it would have been right, right here. Uh, here's a picture of Calhoun in the winter. I took out of the uh, plane. There's the bandstand on Harriet. And so this area is right here. You can see it pretty well in the winter time. And so then uh, the treaty happened in 1851. The Treaty of Traverse de Sioux finally um, was signed. And uh, it left a only a 150 by 20 mile strip of reservation for the Dakota down here along the Minnesota River, but all the rest of the yellow there at that date uh, was signed off to the Europeans who were inundating the whole area anyway. And that started a land rush. Um, the U.S. government kept more than 80% of the money that they promised through the treaty, so it was, it was a horrible thing for the Native Americans and shameful for us. Um, and then soon after we got the rest of Minnesota in the north from the Ojibwe. And one of the uh, negotiators, because he spoke Dakota language, was Joe Brown, remember, who took the canoe up to Lake Minnetonka when he was 18. And here he is on the left uh, with the Siamese, who didn't really realize what, exactly what they were doing with these, these uh, maps and signatures because it was a culture clash. They were all new to them. But uh, one of the signers was Little Crow, and he has some interesting, he's one of the more famous Dakota chiefs, probably the most famous, for a number of reasons. But I found out that he, uh, when he was young, learned uh, to speak some English uh, from Gideon Pond when he grew up in Lucky Pearl, northern Minnesota with him. And also later in his life, uh, in his 30s or 40s, he was selling guns and liquor with Joseph Brown. Uh, so there's all these connections. But he's more famous for reluctantly uh, leading a faction. He was the chief of the Dakota. And in 1862, um, there was the uprising uh, when they had finally had enough with not getting paid, they were starving. starving. Um, and this, of course, was during the Civil War, which was from 1860 to 65. So, so uh, they, were, they rose up and killed uh, a number of, of uh, settlers throughout the area here, as you probably know. And that resulted in uh, final uh, hanging from there were 303 sentence, sentenced in December of 1862, and 38 men were hung uh, by the orders of Abraham Lincoln, who was busy with the Civil War, but, but uh, he didn't want to hang all 300 who had just been you know, associated with the uprising, but just the 38 who they could find evidence for. But even so, it was the largest mass execution in US history. So. Um, another connection uh, is Episcopal Bishop Whipple, uh, who I found this one picture. You can see him standing right here in the middle, and that's just right after the uh, after the execution. The there were hundreds of Dakota around Fort Snelling, and they were all then sent to the reservations and actually exiled from Minnesota. So it all happened pretty quickly at that time after that uprising. But here's Whipple here uh, talking to them, uh, praying with them. And he's connected to Minnetonka because the St. John's uh, Chapel is right across from the Burwell House. And he consecrated that in 1872. So um, let's rush through here. Uh, on the, uh, the part about the settlement uh, around the mills, because I've done a couple presentations on the mills. But uh, 
in October 1851, when it was open for settlement, uh, they started rushing in with claim shanties, and, and here's uh, the first mills were being built on St. Anthony Falls, and this is one of the first real estate offices. It was quite the land rush. And the first house across from St. Anthony, which was on the east side of St. Anthony Falls, the river, but uh, the first house on the west side was built by Colonel John Stevens. And you can see his house in this picture from that time, 1849, with teepees, Dakota teepees around it. His house is right back there. And now, uh, in around 1900, they had hundreds of school children move that house to Minnehaha Falls. And you can see it intact, it's uh, preserved uh, in the Minnehaha Falls Park above the falls. But that uh, was the first one, kind of right here where the bridge was. This is 1855. And notice in just the next four or five years, all these houses were built with the lumber being uh, re quickly uh, cut with the lumber mills in St. Anthony. And as we'll see, a new one on Lake on uh, Minnehaha Creek. And so this is John Stevens' house right here. As these two men left it uh, in 1851 to go and find this rumored lake, this huge, beautiful, sacred lake way out there in the deep woods wilderness. And this is uh, John Stevens' little brother, Simon Stevens, who was only, I think, 23, and his new friend, Calvin Tuttle, who had built a mill in, in St. Croix, so he's experienced, he was about 15 years older. And I recently found this picture, we never had a good picture of him, but I found this one. Happy to add it to our collection. Because he and Stevens took off, uh, and it, they thought it would take three days to get to the lake. That's how little they knew about it. But by the first, uh, about one o'clock the first day, they were at Minnehaha Creek. And if you look at it today, you can actually walk that if you time it with Google. And about the same time, about five, six hours. Anyway, they make the uh, creek and start heading up. And it's uh, winter time, so uh, actually late winter in March of 1851. And they, uh, came, they followed the creek up, there's another old man, and they came to Gray's Bay and they're standing there on the ice and then they walked across and explored for a couple days around the Narrows and Big Island and then came back and down the creek and decided this is a great place to have uh, a mill. And boy was it uh, lucrative those first couple of years because think of it, all of Lake Minnetonka Shore, 250 miles of it, was old growth, thousands of years. You know, these trees were 500 years old. And all they had to do in the winter was cut them down and with horses and sleighs, haul them out onto the ice. And then when the ice melted in April, uh, the following year, 52, they just floated them down to the brand new lumber mill. And that's how they built all the houses so fast with the lumber and the bridge over Hennepin Avenue and so forth. So, uh, and the following uh, summer, or a few months later, actually, Alexander Ramsey, who was soon to become governor, led a party up there to see this wonderful lake that Stevens and Tuttle had found. And here it is from an aerial view. But he wisely decided to keep the name Minis, uh, Minnetonka, which means water for big, so big water. And we're glad that he kept the Native American name. So, and other notable uh, men, settlers who built the first mill there were James Shaver and Amos Gray. Here's James Shaver and his big family. And he lived right here. There's actually Shaver Lake, uh, kind of by Gray's Bay here. Notice it says Out Lake in this early map, but Soon it was named after James Amos Gray, who lived right here. He got all the land 
on the south side where the creek comes into the lake. And this is one of our best photographs of Amos Gray and his wife Susan Collin Gray by their house, which is still stands on Minnetonka Boulevard, kind of past the liquor store. Uh, Nan's house? This past you know, the hundred. Yeah, it's blue now by 101 and Minnetonka Boulevard. And uh, this is his son Will's family on the left and his daughter Ella's family on the right in about 1891. But yeah, they named that after him. And then uh, you can actually take a boat. Once the mill was built uh, that following year, there was a pond. There are mill pond here behind Plymouth Avenue. Right here is the mill on Plymouth Avenue and the Dairy Queen's here, the Burwell House. And you can get in a boat there like this steamship here with the uh, with all the Burwells on it. There's Mr. and Mrs. Burwell. And you can take that all the way to Wyzetta or to Excelsior or Big Island for the big amusement park. So it was quite the thing. Uh, so that was, this was the easternmost navigation of Lake Minnetonka. To get to here, you take at first an ox cart or a horse and then a buckboard and then later a train. Uh, as you see here, in 1869, the first train came through here, train tracks rather. And it looked like this in uh, you know, by 1880s here. Uh, this wonderful drawing and you can see the tracks coming along here. But this is Plymouth Avenue today. And the original shanty that Tuttle and uh, Simon, or Stevens, Simon Stevens built, when they first you know, came back the next year, uh, or just months later, they built a little shack that looked like this. This is a photograph of the oldest building in Minnetonka, which I recently found, it's behind Unmapped Brewery in Glen Lake. Uh, it's private property, but it's an old cow barn, and it's built, they think, in the 1870s. And uh, it's got the old method of cutting uh, and putting together the logs. But uh, that shanty was right here. There's a house on it now, the old Quam house, uh, on the other side of the, the south side of Minnetonka Boulevard. And then at the height of its growth, first there was a lumber mill, that burned down. Then there was a flour mill, that burned down. And then another flour mill, and that would burn down. <laughs> you can imagine all of that with cigars, you know, and they're working in there, and you saw this everywhere. And of course, so three of them burned down. Here's the, all the, there's a long history of all this I have in my Minnetonka Mills presentation. All the, all the presentations, by the way, are on the city of Minnetonka website. You can go to presentations and, and watch them for an hour if you'd like. So here we're up to Charles Burwell and his partner. Uh, well, he was the secretary, and Charles Loring was the vice president. And a man named Fletcher was the president. But, uh, but uh, they owned the mill. Actually, Burwell owned it all outright about 10 years later. Um, and Minnetonka Mills was very successful for a while. And you can see all these other mills that are on, Lake, are on Mayha Creek. Uh, here is Minnetonka Mills. There was a short-lived one called St. Albans, and then Old Mill. But Edina Mills was pretty successful for a long time. and. Uh, Richfield Mills, and then Godfrey Mill is the last one, just south of the, or downstream from the waterfall. This is Edina Mills, the way you look, looked around the late 1800s, you can see this map. This would be 50th Street. You kind of notice it on the left as you're passing the, the uh, tennis courts on the right of Edina Country Club, and you're heading towards downtown, you know, 50s in France. And so that's the way it looked in the late 1800s. Um, and it was also called the Waterville Mill. And, um, and here it is on this map. 
And then instead of Ridgefield, they say rich land mill, and this this map uh, where the extreme comes out of the south side of Lake Harriet and uh, into this marsh. And this uh, presentation is kind of personal because I grew up in this house on 44th and 15th Fremont, which is blocking on the east side of Lake Harriet. And uh, I spent my first 20 years there, and my dad used to say when I was a little boy, because I had this bedroom up here, oh, and this big 200-year-old oak tree. And my dad would say, 120 years ago, there used to be Indians hiding in these branches with a bow and arrow, and they were killing them. I'm hunting for deer in America. I always pictured the Indians in the tree. And so that was right where the red dot is here. And that's interestingly where Gideon Pond's story, or eyewitness uh, story about the Native American uh, battle that I just told you about, that it started right here where the, uh, the murder happened and sparked that. Um, so moving on to the last person uh, who owned the land that I was living on. In fact, he, he is a fascinating man, Colonel William King. And he will kind of represent the European Americans, uh, the epitome of, 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 uh, of wealth and industry that he represented. And he owned all the land from Lake Street to 46th Street and all Lind and Lindale, which was his farm, the Lindale farm, which is now where the park board is on 34th and uh, Bryant, the park board headquarters. And he owned all the east side of Lake Harriet and Calhoun. And so uh, Colonel King um, you know, came here in 1858, and by then, Cloudman's Village had had uh, moved to uh, the Minnesota River, and uh, the Pond Brothers had left. And so he had the same hill here where the red pin is. And over the next 40 years, he acquired the largest solely owned property in Minneapolis history, 1,400 acres farm, with 200 head of cattle and horses and sheep. And, um, and his first estate was called the estate was called the Lindale Farm, located where the park where headquarters go. Oh, and it's called Dupont is called King's Highway. You might have wondered why that's King's Highway for William King. And my house was in the deep woods, the deep suburbs of Minneapolis, which was a tiny town at the time in 1858. And so he was born out east uh, in New York. Um, his father was a Methodist minister. And he moved to Minneapolis as, uh, after he began a, uh, the State Atlas Weekly newspaper. And uh, it was kind of during the Civil War soon after that, and he came to prominence as a uh, anti-slavery abolitionist and early Republican with Abraham Lincoln. Um, and so he became very prominent in the, in the area for his articles against slavery. And he was also the postmaster of the House of Representatives, so he lived out east for a while in Washington, D.C. And for 12 years, he helped deliver the mail, or organize the, the mailing of, to all the representatives. And then later, he became a representative of congressman himself for one term. Uh, and then later he started the Minneapolis Tribune as well. And, uh, and he uh, purchased over 30 parcels of land totaling over $114,000, an equivalent of a couple million dollars in today's land, uh, dollars. And uh, his huge Lindale farmhouse was at 34th and, or 38th and Bryant. You can see all the buildings here. This is a close-up of the, of the house, and then the stables with 100 horse, or 20 horses and a couple hundred uh, cattle. 
and he started uh, what today is the, the uh, state fair. I had the piece of land over uh, Franklin and Inlet, <coughs> or, yeah, Franklin and 28th Street. He had 50 acres and he started the Great North at Western Fair with a hot air balloon in 1881 that was going to fly all the way to the East Coast, but it crashed seven miles east of St. Paul. <laughs> which reminds me of The Wizard of Oz a little bit, which was written in the 1890s too. But yeah, this is a picture of that, that fair. And uh, also, notably, he, part of his land, you see all this green here, is Lakewood Cemetery, where he's buried. And my parents and uh, a lot of famous people like Hubert Humphrey. It's a beautiful cemetery. And it's, he decided to do that because it was an ancient cemetery of the Dakota, there, right in this corner, because their village was right here, of course. And, uh, and you think of it, uh, it could possibly have been a uh, park. You know, wouldn't that be nice, a big amphitheater in it? And, uh, we have a lot of park, which you'll see he was greatly responsible for. But if that was all a huge park, too, it would be great. Um, but why should I say that when my folks are buried there? <laughs> I just yeah, think about it. And this beautiful, um, this beautiful chapel here on the upper left where my mother's service was when she passed a few years ago. You should visit it sometime, it's beautiful. Uh, and so uh, he was uh, good friends with, on the left, Charles Loring. And they together uh, started the park board, uh, along with others like Lowry and Cleveland and some others. But this is one of their first pictures, but we don't have identification of who's in the picture, um, the first park board. But they uh, went about acquiring all the land around Lake Harriet, Calhoun, and Isles. And if you think about it, Cedar Lake too, except for the southeast side, the only private homes on the Chain of Lakes are about five homes on the southeast side of Cedar Lake. And that's how far it had gotten with these new homes way out of the boonies uh, when they kind of went, wait a second, this could all end up being private, which is like Lake Minnetonka today. What if it had a boulevard around the whole thing, public boulevard? That would be amazing. But, uh, but they were so forward thinking that they, they bought the land uh, in different chunks. And uh, we have them to thank for that today. Wonderful, uh, I ride my bike around there all the time. And Charles Loring remembered, not only in Loring Park, he donated the land for Loring Park, uh, but he uh, also uh, made a bicycle path from Lake Calhoun up Minnetonka Boulevard all the way to Calhoun's Corner, which is 101 and, and uh, in Minnetonka Boulevard, just west of here. And uh, so, and in, in this, this uh, plaque here, you see in the Pavilion Park down by the creek here, by the Dairy Queen, on the rock it says, thanks to Charles Loring for donating all the trees, the elm trees, lining the uh, the Minnetonka Boulevard all the way to Lake Calhoun. And what a wonderful thing that was. Here's the Burwells out, Louise and Charles, riding their bikes, stopping at the, uh, by the Dairy Queen, by the fountain there, by the uh, spring there. And other things that you could thank them for, eventually then, uh, because there was this park board and public land around all the lakes, uh, they uh, put the band shell in a series of them. The first one was 1892. This one was really huge. Uh, right where the band shell is today, and I love this picture. I'd like to see it in higher resolution, but all the kids smiling. And they had horse races or buggy races around the lake there. And then this one was built a little later in 1825. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 1905, and it was destroyed by a tornado in 1925. And I found this one photograph of it the day after 
it was destroyed by the tornado. And everybody's going down to Lake Harry to see what happened last night. And this wonderful pavilion was there from uh, 1905 to 90 for 20 years, and all these canoes lined up. You'd row over there and watch the band as you're sitting in a canoe. They had weddings up there and orchestras. It's really a wonderful thing. And in the middle of the Roaring Twenties, got destroyed. Here's a fun picture of the west side of Lake here. You see that pavilion in the distance around 1906 or so with the brand new contraption called a car. <laughs> and in the back is the buggy that they're used to being pulled by a horse. And uh, when I grew up, uh, they had just this supposedly temporary bandstand. It was, the band shell was there for so many years, uh, actually from the 1930s all the way until they built the new one in 1985 or so. And this one here. But I grew up going to shows here. It was just kind of small and that they didn't have enough budget to build a really good one. But but anyway. Uh, and part of their legacy is all these the Grand Browns actually not only goes around all of the lakes here, Cedar Isles and so forth, but also all the way up the creek there's park board and along the Mississippi River and over to Victory Memorial Park and Theaterworth Park. So it's a whole circle that you can ride your bike around. And, and then they, they put a uh, some transit through here too, um, King did, which uh, is next year. Yeah. So one of the other things King did was uh, invest in the Northern Pacific Railway and the Minneapolis Street Railway along with his lawyer, Thomas Lowry. And they started this streetcar system uh, in 1875 with a horse-drawn car that later became electric, which was way ahead of its time. And uh, they went right by his hotel. I'm almost done here. Um, you can see the train going by. This huge hotel that he built and uh, the train tracks actually went all the way out to Excelsior. So he was a busy man, and, uh, but perhaps the crown jewel that he built was, uh, though short-lived, was this luxurious four-story hotel where the Pond Brothers cabin was on a hill overlooking Lake Dave Mahakaska. And he invested $16,000 to build it in 1877. So uh, just you know, 50 years after the ponds, or 40 years. And then built a railway along it for the customers from Minneapolis. It was four stories high with 14 foot verandas, big party rooms, lovely ballrooms. The weekly parties held were very important to the social life of the city until it burned down a few years later. It all burned down. And then in 1883, uh, he, he built another one, right, on the same spot, and he called this one the Lindale Farm, I'm uh, sorry, the Lindale Hotel. And uh, that one also burned down. But uh, the final thoughts here, though, after uh, King, Colonel King threw many lavish parties here, sometimes for 150 couples at his hotel, and so it's easy to imagine that a huge gala party in the luxurious four-star hotel, or four-story hotel overlooking the lake in 1883, that perhaps the Burwells would have been there because uh, King over here, his good friend was Charles Loring, he started the park board, and his lawyer was uh, Lowry, here's Lowry and his wife. So you can imagine they, out of 150 couples that they, invited them, and here's Charles Flooring, and they're all standing perhaps on the veranda thinking about how wonderful it is that this chain of lakes in the young city of Minneapolis is now surrounded by public parkways and extended to the stream, of uh, that little stream down to Minnehaha Creek all the way to its source on Lake Minnetonka, and its mouth at the Mississippi River, and Minnehaha Falls Park as well. And this park system will mean that 
will be the main attraction of Minneapolis that will set an example around the world for the good metropolitan design in concert with nature. So King lived on his Lindale farm until his death in 1900. And within a mile of the teepees of the Dakota village and the cabin of the first missionaries, in a single lifetime of 60 years, these people witnessed the dramatic transformation from a wilderness owned by indigenous people living in harmony with nature to an industrial society of European Americans building a modern city that preserves and showcases its natural resources. A microcosm of the settlement of America. <laughs> the end. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, Loring especially, and uh, in Lowry, remember Lowry Hill is where Kenwood is, and the Lowry Tunnel next to the Walker, those, they were all uh, responsible for this whole system, which included Theodore Park. I just wanted to add that um, my relatives are from Lowry, and they are the ones that Thank you. 